What's up, hobby friends? My name is Casey, and welcome to another Miniature Rescue. This week, we're going to tackle what I can only describe as the absolute worst, most ridiculous model I have ever had the pleasure of buying on eBay. This video is sponsored by Broken Anvil. Stick around to learn how you can save 35% off your next order of fantastic minis. October is in full swing, and this year I thought I'd celebrate by painting some of my favorite orc kits from Games Workshop. Last time we took on the mighty Gazgul Thraka and turned him into a flashy git with some fun and bright colors. The goal was to get away from my regular painting style, which tends to be more on the dark and moody side of things. The grim dark, if you will. And I think we got there in the end. The model ended up with some nice color and really stands out on the table amongst my other green skin minis. That brings us right into this week's model, one that I teased a bit in the last video. We're pretty much going to do the exact opposite with this one. Now I need to prepare you. This may shock you, it may offend your senses. Please, steady yourself, just sit down, right now. This is an Orc Stampa the pride and joy of any orc army, and a model that truly has to be seen to be believed. Okay, that wasn't the part I meant for you to sit down for, but now that I know you are, here is the orc stampa that I just bought off of eBay. This stampa has been making the rounds across the internet. I've seen it talked about in hushed tones in a fair few Facebook groups, as well as the underbelly of Reddit. People have seen this model, and on more than one occasion, I was tagged in a photo of it and asked to buy it. For all who look upon its hideous visage, knew that there would be much work to be done, and I knew that I would be the one to take up this quest to rescue this poor Orc Stampa. Sort of. The real issue is that this was going for $120 on eBay, and nobody was going to pay that when you can seriously get a brand new kit for like $130? But here's something you may not have thought about when it comes to buying models on eBay, because I didn't pay that price. In order to secure a deal on this model, since I was never going to pay MSRP for it, I simply sent a message to the seller, Tistaminis in this case, and asked if they would take less for it. I offered up 50 bucks, knowing that it was a bit of a long shot, but 50 bucks is 50 bucks when you have stock that's been sitting around for the last year or more. And in all fairness, I knew that there would be quite a bit of work on this model since it was missing some pretty key pieces, and of course, all that other stuff on it. I got a message back pretty quick, and all they said was, $50 American, we've got a deal. Which I found to be pretty funny. Maybe that's only me, but I got a good laugh out of that. So I ended up with this very unique, to say the least, model for exactly what I wanted to pay. The point is, if you only want to spend a certain amount on a model, eBay allows you to contact sellers directly just to talk. If you're nice, you be reasonable, you may end up getting exactly what it is you're looking for. I just got this bottle in the mail and it's time to open her up and take a look at what's really going on under all that plastic. First off, this model is huge. Like, not kind of big, but huge. It's about the same size as a Warhound Titan from Forge World, and that's generally considered to be a pretty big mini. As I unwrap the model, I tried to just Take it all in. There's a lot going on here, and it's hard to wrap my mind around everything that this model is currently offering. Now, I did say that this was the worst mini I've ever had the pleasure of buying, but I want to extend a bit of a caveat with that because I want to give some credit to the person who originally put this model together. There are actually good ideas here, and in true orc fashion, it's been partially scratch built to be an over-the-top monster of a model. The extra guns are a cool idea, and there are little quirks with how the model is put together to make it stand off kilter and look kind of wonky in an orky good way. There was thought put into what this was gonna be, but I have a feeling that the original builder just got overwhelmed with the model and decided to trade it in for something else, which I get, it happens to the best of us. The real issue here is in the execution and type of materials that were actually used to build the model. Let me show you what I mean. 
The glue that holds most of this model together is not exactly your standard CA glue. I'm not actually sure what it is. Maybe it's some kind of silicone or Yoohoo glue. And while this stuff does work as an adhesive for a lot of things, it tends to be a bit of a mess on a model. There is also some kind of filler in quite a few areas that I'm pretty sure is either air drying clay or possibly Play-Doh. Either way, it's filled some of the larger gaps in the model, but it's flaking away and it won't permanently fill these gaps for the long term. It's always important to remember that there are specialized materials for building models. Plastic glue and super glue work amazingly well for holding even large pieces of plastic together. And there are a variety of gap fillers out there that won't degrade over time. Some of which I will be applying once we get this thing cleaned up and ready to go again. The other thing to remember is that even if you're having a hard time putting a model together, there are places that can help you. Other people online can motivate you and help you get through. So don't give up. This video is sponsored by Broken Anvil. And if you've had your eye on any of their fantastic minis, I have some very good news for you. Broken Anvil has recently launched a brand new web store and it's full of miniatures for all your tabletop and hobby needs. From their Molly May Goblin Rogue to their Pearl Tooth GIF Wizard, Broken Anvil's web store has you covered. I really like Broken Anvil minis. They're excellent quality and really fun to paint. Their design is really unique and they offer a great selection of high quality models for players and painters alike. And Broken Anvil is offering Miniature Rescue viewers 35% off their order for the next 14 days with code 35off-emrfam. So check out Broken Anvil and their fresh new web store by following the link in the description below. Thanks again Broken Anvil for sponsoring this video. Now back to that giant stompa. The final piece that we need to go over here are the missing pieces and how that was fixed originally. The arms of the model and head are currently being held on by magnets. I can definitely see how this solves the problem that the model probably had when being assembled for the first time. There are pieces missing all over the model, and some of those were used to attach the arms. So instead of using random bits of plastic, magnets were put in place to give the model some movement. It makes sense on paper, but these magnets are just too big and will always look like magnets, even when painted. So they all need to go. I don't plan on doing any major changes to this model after it's finished, so magnets won't be needed. We're not gonna be doing any weapon swaps. What that means though, is that I'm gonna need to find a way to get these arms to stick to the body and still be sturdy enough to be played on the table. I'm gonna take this model apart and see what's really going on underneath. Then we can figure out what needs to be done in order to start getting it back to the original design. As it happens, finding orc bits is a lot easier than you may think. You can take parts and pieces from any kit and make it something orky. If you can make it fit, it might as well be something that an orc salvaged from a fallen enemy and used to fix up their ride. In this case, I do need some bits to fill in space on the body because one of the front panels is missing, as well as the face guard that hides the neck joint. And lastly, pieces to fix the arms to the body. While some of the parts of the model soak in the sonic cleaner, I'm gonna need to find those bits. So let's look through some boxes and see what we can come up with to solve our problems. I decided to start by taking a look at what a completed Stampa actually looks like. It has some really neat walkways along its back as well as a platform that connects the gun arm. So a flat panel across the top can act as a kind of crow's nest as well as a good piece of plastic joining the arm to the body. The first thing I wanna do is go through anything that could possibly fit this model as is. Something from an existing orc kit. Since I have them, I might as well look. So I'm gonna get out my kill team box and take a quick look through a 40K combat patrol box that I've had sitting around for a while. There are some really good looking bits in these boxes. The kill team terrain could be repurposed to fill in a large panel, but I'd have to cut up an entire piece of finished terrain and I don't really want to do that since it's kind of a set. The combat patrol box looks a little bit better. It has an orc death dread in it and those can be useful. The problem really comes down to the size of these bits. Normally, these would be great for converting something orky, but even the death dread is super tiny compared to the stampa and that just won't go far enough to make this work in the ways it needs to. So I pulled out a box of terrain bits that I purchased locally a few months ago. I 
found a guy on Facebook selling three full sets of Games Workshop terrain for a really good price, and I knew that they would come in handy at some point. All of this industrial stuff is going to be perfect. The larger panels can be cut down, and there are some really cool vehicles that can be incorporated into the model and still look really cool. I also have a bunch of ladders that can be used for the back of the model where the walkways are supposed to go. That should work really well, and I'm thinking I can make a whole system of ladders and platforms in the back of this stampa. Okay, so I have a pile of plastic, let's get this model cleaned up and start getting this put back together. The Sonic Cleaner has done an okay job taking up the paint. Still, there is a bunch of glue and clay all over that has to be picked off by hand and by knife. I take my time on each piece and scrape away until I'm left with a pretty clean surface. One of the downsides to getting models in a condition like this is that you really never know what's going to be underneath that paint. Things happen when we build models, and we make decisions in the moment that, while we understand, would make it difficult for other people to see why those decisions were made. It's part of rescuing models, and something that can almost always be worked around, but sometimes I'm really just at a loss and scratching my head. Once these pieces are cleaned, it's time to start dry fitting the model back together and figuring out how it needs to be built. Since there are some larger pieces missing, I'm going to have to get a little creative as to how to fill some of these larger gaps. I'll start by making the model stand up on its own by removing and rearranging the feet. They were twisted inside the body and glued down with what I'm pretty sure was two-part epoxy, so I had to cut them away from the bottom platform. Unfortunately, that made it really difficult and I kind of ended up breaking the entire thing into several pieces. So after gluing the pieces back together, I got the feet into position and got them glued onto the platform. This build is already off to an interesting start, to say the least. Since there are still large gaps in those areas, and the entire platform needs more reinforcement, I decided to get out the milliput in order to fill in the rest of the gaps and make sure that the whole thing wouldn't fall apart after putting the rest of the model on top of it. We need to make sure that the foundation is strong enough to support the entire model. He's a real big guy, after all. To show where they go together and hold a specific angle to make sure that they follow the lines of the base. Of course, we know that there were large gaps before, so after getting rid of all the red clay, it's kind of worse. But they at least fit together to the point that I know that's where they're supposed to go. So I glue as much together as I can, keeping in mind that I'm going to have to patch it with more milliput. That should hold it together nicely and make sure everything will stay together during a game. Once I got the majority of the body together, save the missing front panel, I was able to lower it onto the base and get it glued down. That was a bit tricky, but once I got it in place, I used a little bit of CA glue activator to hold it there until I could get some putty on there and it would really dry nice and tight. The body is now feeling pretty strong. Everything sits nicely and hasn't fallen apart yet, so I think we're in a good place. Now it's time to start filling in the missing areas in the model and make the body complete. I found this awesome little hatch for my terrain bits and put that over the top of the broken one. Then I decided to fit a bit of imperial fencing over the hole in the back. Having a few pieces that are recognizably from the same set also lends itself to looking like a salvage patch job, which I really like. So enough of these pieces bashed together will help give this stampa a cool and unique look. Onto the large hole in this poor stampa's chest. I decided to use the large orc scrap skull to cover most of it, but there was going to be a rather large hole near the bottom that I couldn't really decide how to cover. Then it kind of hit me. I could use it like kind of a cargo hold, where the top could come down and cover it, but something could come out. I put a bunch of different bits on the inside, tubes, walls, and ladders, and in the end I decided it would be awesome to have this little grabby hook vehicle kind of bursting out of the front. The top could come down to overlap it a little bit and help bring it into the design, and the hook could be considered a cool extra bit coming off the front. I thought as well that I could build out a little platform in the front and have an orc standing there like it was part of the plan all along. So that's something to keep in mind as this continues to build out. Where can I place orcs so that they live on or in this huge monster stampa? The back of the model is probably lacking the most detail right now, and that really needs to be taken care of. Luckily, these bits of terrain that I've been working with have walkways and railings that will go perfectly with the bits that have already been glued on. I started with the first platform and built off of that. This is another great spot for an extra orc to have the high ground. I have the high ground! 
I really like how this all ended up going together. The platforms are big enough to fit a few bodies and the ladders got cut down to create the perfect length to go between each level. All right, so this is probably the most difficult part of this rescue. The big gun arm doesn't have any of the parts that it needs to be attached to the body in the correct position. Even with the magnets, it was angled off to the side and not sitting flat enough to build out the platform for the orcs to reach it. So I went through some old bits I had for an Imperial Titan and found part of the arm assembly that I didn't actually use. It has the arm attachment for the knight, and that should give us something to pin to the side of this stomp butt. I cut off the ammo tank and sanded it flush so it would fit on the side of the actual guns. Once that was glued on, I was able to use a little milliput to make sure that the gaps were filled in and it would stick more permanently. Then I used some extra plates from the terrain I've been using to make armor plates much like the body. And for the platform that connects it to the body, an old rhino back door. The inside of the tank door is basically diamond plating, so it looks perfect as a connector. All in all, it worked out very well, and I think it looks very much like it was actually intended. The other arm, actually not much to say about that one, it was pretty much good to go. The connection points were still intact underneath the magnets, so I just put it on. The last thing to do was to give this fella a set of jaws. The head actually looks pretty bad sitting on top of it all by itself, and I wanted to make sure to cover up the neck so it looked cooler. Unfortunately, the original jaws that fit on the head and cover that bad joint wasn't included, so I had to look elsewhere. I seriously looked for a good hour through all of my bits, and I couldn't find anything that I could turn into a set of metallic jaws. I ended up taking the front off of my old orc truck that I rescued a few years ago, in which I 3D printed a sweet spiky grill for the front. I didn't want to take it off since it was sized perfectly for the truck, but the way I was thinking about it is I really didn't have any other option right now. I mean, I could get the 3D printer out, get it all set up, find the files for the grill, size it, print it, but I just moved and I don't really know where the power cable is for the printer. So this is gonna have to do, and wouldn't you know, it, it actually worked out pretty well and really finishes off this model. So the Stampa is now a complete model, and on top of that, it's a very custom monstrosity, something that really is mine now, and it has its own unique look as a centerpiece model. I'm pretty excited about it. Of course, it still needs paint, and we're gonna get there, but before that, we need to fix a few issues and get this model ready. I mentioned at the top of this video that we were going to be doing the exact opposite type of paint job that I did on that Gazgul Thraka model that I painted last time. He's clean, he's pretty, for an orc, and I was trying to expand the way that I approach my painting. This guy, well, he's got a lot of problems that we need to actually accentuate and add to. So grimdark it is, and here's how we get started. Using texture paint, something with a little grit in it, I'm gonna go over areas of the model that are gonna be rusty or dirty and coat them with that paint. This is gonna do a couple of things. It's gonna add the grittiness to the model and give it that texture. And it's also gonna cover up any broken or missing pieces. I do want to focus this around joints and near the bottom of the model, so it looks well used and war torn. And once this step is done and dry, it's finally ready to be primed. It is amazing how different this guy looks. Seriously, it's already been a long journey just to get to this point, and I almost don't want to touch it with a paintbrush. But that's really not why we're here, and it needs to be done now. So let's paint bravely and get it done. The first major decision is going to be color, and because last time I went with yellow, we're going to double down and do yellow again. I'm going to show you the easiest way to get a good yellow that has highlights and shadows built in. And you know what? I wasn't going to say it, but here it is. We are going to slap chop this bad boy right now and get it ready for a game. Okay, not really slap chop, but it uses the same ideas. So the first thing is to get a white undercoat on the model, something to set us up for a filter of transparent yellow. These armor panels are really big too, so I'm going to focus the white towards the center and top of each one, leaving a bit of black around the edges and near the bottom. Once the model is covered and looking pretty good, I'll take some muted pink from Liquitex and lay down the shadows. This will be mainly focused on the undersides of larger objects and near the edges and bottom of each armor panel. Follow that up with a few light coats of Liquitex yellow, the transparent one and you get a seriously bright yellow and deep orangey brown shadows. So you see, it's like Slap Chop, but with an airbrush and inks. Normally we just call it a filter, 
which is what you're actually doing with the slap chop method anyways, but also not. It's, it, we don't need to go into it. Enough with the slap chop. Okay, so we have the main color on the model. Next step will be to matte varnish that shiny ink and start to work on the metallics. For a lot of these metal bits, I can actually take my dark steel from Vallejo Metal Color and just airbrush it on. And to finish it all off and reach the small panels on the body, I'll just use a paintbrush. This really breaks up the color and starts to add a ton more interest to the model. Even though that yellow looks really good, it still needs things to break it up or you start to lose details in a sea of color. That also means that we're gonna need to create even more separation by adding more color. So let's do that right now. In order to start weathering this model down a bit and really bring out that grimdark vibe, I decided to mix up a few different oil washes. The first one will be an all over wash of black. This will help separate the armor panels and essentially black line the model. The second wash is gonna be a teal verdigris that I mix with blue and bright green. This will be more targeted to the panels that need a little more color and will end up mixing with some kind of rust. Not that rust has or creates verdigris, but the colors right next to each other are great and will play into the theme of this model. It's scrapped together from all sorts of materials and painted over. So weathering, rusting, and all of the above can mix nicely and give us some good color variety. Plus it's fake, so whatever. I went pretty hard with this and covered almost every large metal part. I also used a small brush to hit a ton of rivets and let the oil run down the sides to look like water damage. And to finish it all off, I used a little bit of dirty down rust on the panels and over a lot of the textured areas to give it some rust. Altogether, it looks pretty nice and dirty. Now that the first weathering pass is complete, I wanna shine up a lot of the metal parts by doing a dry brush of bright aluminum. Mostly to bring back some metallic shine on larger objects, but I also wanna hit some of the edges of weathering to give the impression that there's still a little bit of metal holding this thing together. It's quick and it really adds a nice level of shine to the metal. The other thing we need to do is chip the paint up on the body. So I go around each panel and paint in some chipping. This really gives each panel more separation from the others and a ton more visual interest to the model. I'm really happy with the way that this went and it looks properly torn up now. The last addition to the model I wanna do for now is to add a bit of freehand. Originally, I was planning on laying down some orc decals, but seriously, none of the ones that I actually have are big enough to make sense. So freehand it is. The first one to go down will be a set of red flames on one of the front panels. I drew it out with a pencil and then filled it in with a dark red paint. It definitely adds that orky feel to the overall paint job, but we need to keep going to try and balance out this model with the red. Next up, I lay down a nice checker pattern over the faceplate. I did the same thing with a pencil and lightly drew it in, filled it in with dark red, and then came back in with some lighter red to keep it bright on the top. I followed that up with a thin glaze of black on the bottom of each square to make them look like they were scratched into the yellow rather than painted in. And I finished it off with some chipping to complete that effect. The last bit of the model is to add some weathering powder to really punch up the rust and dirt. It also allows me to incorporate this model into my existing army that has a ton of this orange rust powder added to it already. So I take my time and go around each piece of the model adding little bits of orange rust. As a final addition, I really wanna get a few boys on this Stampa. Having a few painted models riding this guy really makes it more complete and makes each piece of the model tell a bit more of a story. Like, how did that orc get up there? What are they doing over here? That type of thing. Moreover, it really gives you a sense of scale. This Stampa is a big model and these orcs are very small in comparison. Now that we are closing in on the end of October, I'm getting a little sad. Not that I couldn't just keep painting orcs right into November and beyond, but you know, the season where I get to see special orc projects online every single day is almost over. The community really rallies around this quasi event every year and it's amazing to see how many creative and talented people there are out there coming up with absolutely amazing works of art centered around orcs, of course. This particular build was one of the toughest that I've encountered on this channel and it took many, many hours to actually complete. Paint job aside, it took me a stupid amount of time just to clean the thing. 
I'm hoping that the original owner is out there and still hobbying, and that this video can serve as a reminder that even if we make mistakes and try new things that don't quite work out, with a little bit of elbow grease and perseverance, we can push through and get to a model that we can be happy with. I am very excited about how this Stampa turned out. He's got a proper amount of orc scrappiness about him and a grand helping of dirt and grime. The perfect recipe for a successful orc project that can serve in my army. Thank you again for joining me on another miniature rescue. If you like something about this video, please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing as it really helps out the channel. Once again, I'm Casey, and I will see you in the next video. And of course, here is the completed Orc Stompa. Thanks again, guys.